Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, finding solutions to Albuquerque's housing crisis. In an exclusive interview, Mayor Tim Keller lays out his ideas and calls for an open-minded approach to the problem. The default for Albuquerque right now is no, you can't convert a hotel. No, you can't convert a commercial building to real estate. No, you can't have a casita. And we want to shift. And the governor sets the priorities for her second term as we look ahead to the 2023 legislative session. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. As we look ahead to 2023, the upcoming legislative session is top of mind. In less than 15 minutes, I ask our line opinion panelists for the week how the governor's priorities will fare during the 60-day session. We're also going to examine the three choices for a new state public regulation commission as the legislature waits to confirm the governor's appointments. But we start this week with an interview you'll only see on New Mexico in Focus. Late last month, Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller joined me in studio to talk about a slew of issues impacting the city, but most notably, housing. The mayor is pushing a new plan to increase the number of rental units in the city. It's called the Housing Forward Initiative, and it calls for 5,000 new units by 2025. It underscores the city's dire need for housing, but it won't be a simple process. As the mayor explains, the city needs action on housing right now. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller, thank you for being here. Studios of New Mexico PBS, really appreciate it. Good to be with you. Let's talk about your housing ideas. We've got something going on here that a lot of the country is struggling with, Mayor, as you know, I'm not telling you something you don't know, but we are short on housing, particularly affordable housing in a growing community. We have some generational changes. Let's talk about a lot of that. I want to ask you about the Housing Forward Initiative. Now it's a plan to address the city's lack of affordable housing. The city is somewhere between 13,000, 28,000 units short of our current needs. How did we get here <laughs> uh, so short on housing? <clears throat> you know, it's, it's one of these things that we came out of the pandemic and like you said, all over the country, but also here. And I remember hearing, you know, rents are up 41% and trying to think about, well, what can we do with some, right. you know, rent subsidies or housing stabilization? And, and those are still important discussions. Mm -hmm. But then we looked at the numbers and the numbers that you just quoted are staggering for our city. I mean, 30,000 units, right. you know, and this is actually, it's across every spectrum. It's more acute, certainly, in sort of low income and affordable. But the irony is the situation is so bad in Albuquerque, like any house right now is helpful. Right. And so once we saw that the numbers were that big, we said, you know what, we actually have to have a response that matches that. It's not about, it's not a post-pandemic phenomenon for us. I see. We've got basically, I think, about a five-year window to get this right in Albuquerque or else we're gonna have a city that it's much more akin to sort of a Phoenix, you know, you know, suburban track housing sort of situation. It's inevitable unless we fix this. And of course that leads to all sorts of other challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, the plan calls for the creation of 5,000 new affordable housing units. Pretty aggressive when you really think about mm -hmm. this. Um, is it possible, honestly, in this short a time period? You know, it is a reach goal. Okay. I'll, I'll certainly admit that. But I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to combo uh, getting a situation where the private sector can fill a lot of that gap in the nonprofit sector and then the city doing some on our own. So just very briefly, you know, mm -hmm. a slice is about us buying actually hotels and converting them and changing them to housing. Right. And then also incentivizing partners to do that too. And so we do have some funding to do that. We, we've got sort of a green light between anywhere you know, two to four hotels we're looking at for doing that. And uh, the rest of it is about getting our zoning code in a place mm. where it actually makes sense for both uh, someone who wants to uh, live in, in, a, in a sheltered, you know, facility of any kind, uh, whether it's a full on house or an apartment or a duplex or a casita or whatever, mm -hmm. um, getting that to a place where also it makes sense for the private sector to build them. And so uh, that right now, we're totally upside down as a city in our zoning code. Uh, right now, it's all about a you know, one-story, single-family house. And uh, we need diversity in housing, too. And we need all kinds of types of housing um, to be available and also to be supported by our zoning code. So that's, it's a long, about a six month window, council's digesting this and the community and so forth. But if you put all that together, I think we can get near 5,000. Let's go back to the hotel bit. You say there's about two to four here in town. Can you tell, tell us where those are? 
in terms of the city actually leading it, we know we have funding. Council actually gave us a big chunk of funding to do this. Mm -hmm. And look, converting a hotel, so think of the old rundown hotels on Central mm -hmm. or maybe the ones by Los Altos. Um, you know, there might be some even like the old Desert Hills campus on the uh, west side. Yeah. You know, the idea is it's cheaper and faster, meaning, uh, you know, if you build a brand new set of uh, units, obviously that's the most expensive way to go. Um, and so it also takes the longest. And so if we convert these, you know, typically you have to supply sort of kitchenette type uh, um, uh, changes to the units and so forth, mm -hmm. and then mix in supportive housing, um, uh, you know, at like actual, cons if, if they're a behavioral health situation or a mental health situation, you're actually getting sort of that consulting help in there, mm -hmm. in that clinical help, if that's the case. But if it's just folks in general for different types of housing, then you don't need that. So it's mixing all that together with hotels that have the right community space or the right shared kitchen space or, or not. Right. Uh, so it depends on the hotel is the short question. We're sure. in conversation with, I'd say, 10 as a whole. Okay. And I think we'll definitely do two. We want to try and do uh, more. Interesting. Um, I'm interested in your, in your in the sense of office buildings as well, not just hotels. We have a lot of empty office space here. Is that a viable solution for the homeless problem? You know, it is. And this is part of the, you know, I hate to, to I don't want to go down the zoning, really boring discussion, mm -hmm. but this also is being held up by our zoning code. So we want to make it really easy to convert a commercial uh, building to residential. I think in some ways, actually, government just has to sort of set up the playing field for this, and then nonprofits and the private sector can actually do it. But they've been very clear. Both anyone in this world will tell you, like right now, the city environment, you just can't do this. Mm -hmm. You're, it's all nearly impossible to do the conversion that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, casitas are another aspect of this. Let's know? talk about casitas. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of feedback <laughs> on casitas, especially <laughs> from our viewership. Yeah. It really rings a bell. Some folks are very much for them. Some some folks really are very afraid of them. Any early indications on the size of the casitas that might be allowable, uh, the size of the lot you would have to have as a minimum size? Are we down the road that far? Or where should folks be thinking about casitas at this point? Let me mention this. The key is the default. See, the default for Albuquerque right now is no, you can't convert a hotel. No, you can't convert a commercial building to real estate. No, you can't have a casita. And we wanna shift, at least for some areas or in certain places where it makes sense, we wanna shift that to yes, mm -hmm. but then there's always, you know, you can object and so forth. I mean, that's still gonna be there. It's about changing the default for how we grow. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the North Valley folks that we hear from are especially concerned about the casita idea, meaning there are casitas in place. If you go through the North Valley, mm -hmm. they're everywhere. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, as an ex-builder, I built some years ago, 20 years ago, and, in, but it's a di it can be a difficulty to build a casita on a private small lot. It, there's a lot of interruption for the neighbors. All these things yet to be decided. Or, or are you comfortable that we can get the casita idea off the ground here with all the objections that might in fact happen? You know, I am only because I do believe in sort of the, the power of actually policy making. Okay. And uh, we're gonna debate this and work it out in terms of even, yeah, the spacing and like how big right. your lot has to be. So all of those are now, there's a first placeholder that went to the EPC, this committee that sort of starts with that. So they have the placeholder, but we know they're gonna change it and then council might change it. Right. And there's also like historic overlays. So, you know, any neighborhood, like a lot of the North Valley neighborhoods are not, it's not gonna apply to them anyway because they already have historic overlays on top of it. I so I think they're really uh, in a much better situation because they've already dealt with these issues. Mm -hmm. But when you think of just the vast sort of, you know, midtown area or you think about areas on the west side, they don't have historic overlays and they don't have rules and regulations on this. And mm -hmm. that's really what we need. It's, it's time, you know, mm -hmm. as a city, we're, we're growing up and we got to have policies that match it. That's a key distinction. Um, I got to ask you this question. I've asked some of the guests we've had on this idea of housing so far. Are we ready to go vertical here in Albuquerque? Meaning, just like you said a few minutes ago, we can't keep <clears throat> spreading Phoenix like with single story, quarter acre lots, but there's a lot of resistance here to going above a certain sort of a height. Mm -hmm. or, or, or is it time for us to change on that? And can we change and going vertical? You know, I think what came out of uh, my realization this summer from reading the studies is that we have to. It's, it's actually not really a choice. Okay. You know, the only choice is then to have like, you know, it would, it would, it would sort of create like Berlin and Las Lunas would be these giant cities, you know, 30 years from now, right. uh, if we keep going the way we're going. 
Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you actually believe in Albuquerque as sort of the, the metro center and the commercial center for the state of New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to grow up a little bit. But the good thing is, you know, where we do that, how high is high, you know, right. three stories or five stories, I think we can actually take that, you know, uh, in a gradual way and through a public process. And I'll give you an example, you know, Edo. Uh, which now, I mean, we even say the word Edo and we don't have to say what it means. Right. You know, 10 years ago, I remember people like, what does Edo mean? And when we redid the zoning in there, this was part of it. We allowed people to go up uh, more stories. Right. And so I think, you know, we can also do it tactfully and smartly in the areas of town where it makes sense. Okay. And the good thing is, one thing we do have is a robust planning and zoning process, you know. So none of this ever happens without, you know, years of debate and policy making. Right. And so that's appropriate. And so I do think though, these are the issues we do have to face because when you're short 30,000 houses, right. you, just, you, you can't avoid it. So either rents are gonna skyrocket and price everyone out, or we're gonna get this bizarre dynamic where we're this tiny little city surrounded by huge suburbs. Right. Is this an opportunity for more density, in fact? If we do this smart, can we pack people in, not to make that sound like it's you know, <laughs> sardines, but you know what I'm saying, there's, there's, there's benefits to neighborhoods being very closely packed together. Is that part of the process in your planning here, Mayor? Were you thinking we can get to some kind of urban density, which changes transportation issues, mm -hmm. changes a lot of different issues out there. Yeah, and it makes things like, I mean, the rail trail that we're building, which is a pedestrian parkway, I mean, that becomes meaningful for commuting right. if you have density around there. And I would say this, look, our city, uh, there's some g really good news here. It's the right time for Albuquerque to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, cities, Boston, other cities, San Francisco, I mean, they're way too late. Like, it's all too far gone. Right. But when I think about density, infill is really important. And mm -hmm. we all can drive around town and see dilapidated warehouse areas that uh, could be used for a better use. And right now it would be for housing. So I think there absolutely is opportunity for infill and, and by definition that's going to increase density. But then you get the other aspects, the benefits around it of public transit and so forth. And, and for us, you know, even whether it's police and fire coverage, that's always going to be a better return on investment than trying to do it way out, you know, in greenfield development, you know, way out on, on uh, you know, it's sort of the outside of the city where it's very expensive. Sure. But lastly, I would just say the funny thing is, you know, I, I think this will be done to us anyway. That's how big the problem is. Like, we are going to get more dense. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we going to do it, you know, in a way that is planned and thoughtful and equitable? Or are we just going to leave it to the rules of the game now, which I think really run the risk of creating, you know, terrible sort of pockets of poorly planned development and transit and public safety and things like this. Right. And so now's the time. I mean, this really is a unique opportunity for our city, probably the most unique in about 50 years since the 70s, mm -hmm. where we can define what the city is going to look like for the next 70 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, rents have spiked, Mayor, as you know, tremendously in the city. Tremendously. A lot of folks are really under the gun here financially because of it. How soon can you see relief coming? And the second question, probably the first question is, what do you consider affordable? We hear the administration hmm. saying affordable, affordable. Affo what is affordable in a, in a median in, medium price of rent now is about $1,200 here in Albuquerque. That's yeah. just not affordable for a lot of folks. What is affordable when you talk <laughs> about affordable housing? Well, you know, I think it, it, it does depend on if it's affordable housing for a family, you know, or a single person sure. and, you know, sort of uh, what's on the other end of their utility costs and their transport costs and things like that. So, yeah. you know, I would leave the dollar number really to the experts or to some of the, the folks that, you know, you talk to uh, on this show. But I would say this one, it's definitely too high. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's sort of two aspects in the short term. We're looking at a rent stabilization fund in hopefully in partnership with the state, hmm. that because there is a lot of extra money at the state as we've heard, like this is a great way to use some of it, to just tamp down those rents uh, for several years until the only solution is more housing. I mean, it does go back to more housing at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's how you really lower rents, is to add more housing. Are, are you talking <clears throat> money going to builders or to renters for rent abatement? Or, or how would you see this money being used? I think rent abatement is in the short term where we've got to go. Now, okay. if there's other aspects of this where uh, we can work it through you know, the owners, I'm open to that too, but it's got to actually bring down rent. Right. Uh, and so this is something we did a little bit during the pandemic. And basically it's sort of a, another version of that with more money for a longer time period. Mm -hmm. But there's also, um, you know, discrimination. And so, you know, we have now passed ordinances at the city 
and have our civil rights office tasked up with uh, renter discrimination. Mm -hmm. In a sense, like if you're getting a voucher and they won't rent to you, uh, that's illegal. And we're now, we're, we are looking to actively prosecute that to make sure that the message is sent that you can't do that. And so that's also part of the puzzle too, because a lot of people are getting, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to say you're part of the housing stabilization fund and then have landlords beg, well, we don't, you know, want that kind of person in our building. We're not going to allow that. So mm -hmm. that there's other aspects that we have to build in to make that fund work. But gotcha. Albuquerque's ready. We've got the civil rights office on that and ready to go. Interesting. Um, Anybody in the legislature ready to carry this for you? Are you expecting some action out of the legislature this session? You know, I am. I know a lot of folks are talking about it. I think Senator Lopez has been uh, talking about this. Right. And so uh, many of the urban senators have mentioned it and, and House reps too. So okay. we don't have, you know, specific bills and so forth lined up. But I know even back right before the pandemic, when, when we again had a lot of extra money, you know, there was even an idea to just make a chunk of it to just build housing and then, you know, lease it out to nonprofits to do this. Right. And that's something, look, we do need this statewide. And so I think the good news is we love an all the above approach. Any right. tool is a good tool. So uh, for the legislature, whatever they want to fund and come up with, we'll back it. It was great to get a chance to catch up with the mayor on housing, but we're not done with him yet. During part two of my interview, I asked the mayor why he thinks the city should consider safe outdoor spaces as part of the equation on solving homelessness. That's coming up in less than 20, or actually less than 30 minutes. Now, right now, let's welcome in our line opinion panelists for the week. Joining me at the virtual roundtable, we have Merritt Allen from Vox Optima Public Relations. My man, Michael Byrd, the former president of the American Public Health Association. He's with us this week. And we're pleased to have Julianne Grimm. She's editor and publisher at the Santa Fe Reporter. Now we're looking ahead to the upcoming 2023 legislative session, of course. And this week we have some new indications on what the Democratic agenda could be. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham was sworn in for her second term late last week. And during her inauguration ceremony, she talked about her goals for New Mexico for the next four years. She laid out several priorities, mentioning things like affordable housing, homelessness, and early childhood education. We'll get into some of those topics in a moment, but let's start with an overarching theme. Merritt Allen, let me start with you, which was health care. The governor says she wants to create a new New Mexico health care authority. She wants to cover all public school employees' health care premium costs, and she wants to codify the right to get an abortion. With a Democratic majority on the House, Merritt, are these health care goals realistic or just overly ambitious? Got to throw it all out there before the session starts. How do you see this at this point? Well, um, I, I see this as just more money without necessarily um, a lot of solutions, although I'm very interested to hear what Michael um, uh, has to say about uh, uh, the um, health care agency. I just see that as another layer of administration that's mm -hmm. perhaps not really delivering health care. Um, covering health care premiums for teachers, is that going to improve um, school scores or educational outcomes? No. Um, might it, and might it, uh, Merit, might it attract more people to the business of teaching, which we desperately need? Maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. We pour money into PED. Uh, we've already sunk so much money into early childhood. We have a early childhood investment fund. Now we have a constitutional amendment to raid uh, the permanent fund for early childhood. One thing she never mentioned mm -hmm was child welfare, which is a different thing, which mm -hmm. is CYFD, which is a tremendous issue. But of course, this was an inaugural speech, which is really a soft speech. She's going to talk right. about happy stuff. Right. Um, I think we're going to hear the real nitty gritty in the state of the state speech in a few weeks. That's a good distinction. I appreciate you mentioning that. That, that is a good distinction for folks to keep in mind. Uh, Michael, the governor also mentioned tackling poverty and homelessness saying she would push to expand access to affordable housing. You know, addressing homelessness has been tricky here in Albuquerque, as you know. And as we'll discuss again later in the line, is the governor making the right choice to focus on statewide solutions to this housing situation? Should, be, should he, she be honing in on something a little bit finer, like where the problem is? Well, I, okay, first of all, let me just say, I think that, um, you know, poverty really is the underlying issue mm -hmm. in New Mexico. And I mean, being one of everybody, and this is nothing new to anyone, any one of us or anybody who's paying attention mm -hmm. in terms of um, national, our national rating in terms of one of the states that has some of, has one of the highest poverty rates. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you, you know it it many of the issues again are multifaceted and it's it's um you know it there 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 are no simple solutions to to the issues that we're confronted by mm -hmm. um i think that as far as um what the governor's proposing to the legislature until we really see some something specific it's really hard to i think comment um mm -hmm. on on um, you know what what is going what she's proposing and what's going how that would roll out mm -hmm. um I, one of the things i think that um that is is a is my concern as well as the concern of many people is is children youth and families division and and you know and the press that and the stories about how children have have not been well attended to and 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 the and some of the tragedies that have occurred and so it's one thing to create a system mm -hmm. um it's one thing but it's another thing to really ensure that there's accountability and that those systems are functioning in the manner that they were established and that they're meeting the needs of children and the community mm -hmm. um and until until you have that um it's a little you know it and and i'm not saying that, that you know i mean but that is i think something you know if if one is going to pay some attention to something that is something that really deserves some mm -hmm some attention and so i hope that i hope 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 there's some focus on that and getting getting in, making sure that that system is functioning and protecting the children and families Good points there cyfd is just still sort of hanging out there absolutely hey juliana i'm going to switch just a little bit of a gear here a few days before the inauguration the governor appointed three candidates to the public regulation commission she chose a former state lawmaker and two public utility experts now, notably left off the commission is a Native American perspective. And given the vested interests of tribal communities in northwestern part of our state, as you know, is it a mistake to not have a tribal voice on the PRC as opposed to, uh, and you'll clue us in how she actually did it. But first things first, was that a mistake not having a, a Native voice on the council? Well, I think that, you know, it's good to back up a little bit and just talk about the process that New Mexico Perfect. is you know, embarking on. This is a brand new thing. We've had, you know, elected public regulation commission with five members. Now we're switching to an appointed commission with three members. And the appointment process was um, crafted to mimic the judicial appointment process. Mm -hmm. and so you started with 62 applicants. 15 of them were then interviewed by this committee, which, you know, famously included legislators and, and a number of other folks. Um, and then there was a short list of nine mm -hmm. that went to the governor and she chose three from the shortlist. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you sort of look at the broader representation, it's instructive in answering your question. Mm -hmm. I think it's also really noteworthy that um, the state Supreme Court um, shot down a sort of 11th hour piece of litigation, you know, attempting to inject more diversity. And, and really to, there were some geographic um, requirements about could be a certain number of people from certain counties, but there's no, there's nothing in the criteria that says you have to pick someone from Indian country. You have to pick someone who's lives in one of the places like the San Juan or the Permian Basin, you know, right. the, the choosing of those three people um, for this, you know, highly specialized small board um, really, you know, there was a lot, a lot that went into it. But the Supreme Court, I, I got distracted from that a little bit. They considered this case and said, no, the constitutional amendment was um, properly brought forth and it was clear. And what's happening now is what people voted for. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're in a position where we have to move forward with that. Mm -hmm. um, the other sort of interesting political wrinkle is when the three selected commissioners were announced, the governor also announced this new advisory committee, which she's calling the Tribal Advisory Council. Um, and it has uh, requirements of membership from all, you know, kind of several different quarters but again this is a small group that mm -hmm. she's calling for the creation of mm -hmm. and for that group to then advise the people that really have the power like that's a little that's like too little too late on that front <laughs> it, it's kind of trying to make up for the fact that 
yeah, there's no natives on this board. Also, there's no women on the PRC now, which right. I think, you know, is is an issue. Um, and really, though, you know, I'm curious to see how how the first decisions kind of roll out and how the hearings go, yeah. um, because the PRC doesn't get a lot of attention until things are ugly and like they're pretty ugly right now. Pretty f fair enough there. Michael, your, your thoughts on that, the idea that uh, this advisory committee that will have no voting response, you know, it just, how does that hit your gut? <laughs> uh, well, to be honest, it stinks. Um, it, you know, under the previous system, there was, there was native representation. Mm -hmm. um, in New Mexico, we like to talk about how multicultural we are and how we're all kumbaya and, and, um, and um, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of that sort of facade. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it's a facade to some extent. Mm -hmm. but the reality is, is, is there is such a thing as tribal sovereignty. There is such a thing, and the federal government recognizes the, it. The, the state government has recognized it as well in many ways. But when it comes to this, no native representation, it, I th it's an affront. I mean, it, 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 you know, there are native, there are qualified native people who, d who deserve to, uh, to have a seat at the table. And the fact that there's no, and we're 11% of the population, we have significant holdings in terms of land holdings, mm -hmm. businesses here in New Mexico generate incredible revenue for the state. And to not, I, I, I think it's insulting. To, to, and and to be to create then a token token mm -hmm. advisory group mm -hmm. where nobody has to listen to they they can have a they can voice their concerns but it's it's well thank you very much mm -hmm. and and, and, meet, and getting to meet once a quarter I, I just <laughs> that that's that's bizarre to me I, I don't get that let me bounce to merit here real quick merit is the problem the number here I've often felt. And now here we are that doing three versus five right. on the PRC, someone was going to lose. And now right. we have Mr. Little, uh, we, uh, Michael uh, mentioned not by name, um, uh, who was a perfectly qualified Native American man and no women. That would have been two people that would have been really good to have on the PRC. Did we basically screw this up fundamentally by making this a three seat? Uh, uh, Go ahead, sorry. You also lose. You also lose regional coverage. Right. Yeah. At the same time, um, but also, you know, one of the goals, and I think the reason uh, voters voted to professionalize the PRC, if you will, was to try and streamline the process. That's right. Because the regulatory climate in New Mexico is a mess, and that's why we can't. One major reason why we can't attract businesses to our state. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I don't think a five person panel is too large. You can certainly get consensus and move business forward with five people. It's mm -hmm. not too large. Mm -hmm. um, and then say that you shall not have more than three of any uh, 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 major political party. So you could have three D's, two R's with a right. D governor. That that's would right. have been fine. That's right. Um, I think that size would probably uh, make more sense uh, for coverage and for skill sets. Uh, you know, not having somebody out of the National Energy Labs, uh, considering we're an energy producing state, yep. and we need uh, we need more uh, consideration of how we move forward from a fossil fuel to a sustainable renewable um, energy uh, uh, energy economy. Mm -hmm. uh, we need uh, more legal expertise as we try and streamline our. Byzantine regulatory, or really ad hoc Byzantine regulatory climate. We seem to come up with uh, regulations on the fly as as issues come up, and it's it's uh, not a good situation. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the current PRC situation is an attempt to make things better. It's not a complete solution for the reasons that have just been brought up. Yep. That's Joseph D. Little, by the way. I didn't get his full name out there. He's the former general counsel to the All Indian Pueblo Council. And I would have thought it would have been a proud, I, I don't know, it's a very interesting thing. Who could not say this man is not qualified to be on the PRC? I'd like to see somebody try to convince me of that. Got to move on though. Thanks to our line opinion panel for that one. We'll meet right back here in less than one minute. 
Talk about the latest developments in Albuquerque's debate over safe outdoor spaces. I've never said that it's the be all end all to anything. I think it's a small tool mm -hmm. that we should try. And again, we're, look, in, in, in Albuquerque, like, we have a lot of challenges. So I'm open to any idea that might work. And Safe Outdoor Space is one of them, but I actually think it's a, it really is only applicable to a small amount of folks, but we still should try it. Welcome back to our line. Panelists will hear from the mayor on this issue in about 10 minutes, and that's safe outdoor spaces. Now, it's been a contentious topic for Albuquerque City Council. Last month, council voted five to four to outlaw safe outdoor spaces. That decision was met with a repeat veto from Mayor Keller and another veto override this time attempt that fell short Wednesday night. Now, after three vetoes from the mayor on this issue, should the council reconsider their approach here, Merritt Allen, or is this the start of another year where the council and the mayor just go back and forth on this issue? I think it's possible that uh, the council and the mayor may be uh, debating uh, safe open spaces up until tw the 2025 mayoral election. Um, it's, it, it is uh, vote badminton. Um, we have really the the clincher vote is District 8, Trudy Jones, who's not running for re-election from what I have read, mm -hmm. and she has a pretty safe Republican seat. I think it's likely that the Republican who does not replace her, who will be uh, declaring for election uh, this year, it's a safe Republican seat, will not share her view uh, that safe open spaces are a good mm -hmm. idea. So it's got to happen this year. This impasse has to be broken this year. Mm -hmm. So there's that political reality. And then... Um, I think there's just the general uh, frustration that the city is feeling. Uh, millions of dollars have gone into uh, the effort for the homeless. We have, a, as a result, a 30-unit tiny homes uh, village uh, that was built at a cost of over $800 per square foot. Right. Um, that's a lot nicer than my house. Yep. Um, the $14 million Gateway Center opening next week, which will yield 50 beds, so that's about $280 per bed. Uh, so we're seeing long delayed projects, lots of money, and uh, 80, uh, 80 beds coming out of it. Mm -hmm. That's a, a lot. Uh, we have a lot more homeless than we're creating overnight uh, beds or uh, transitional uh, transitional homes for them. Meanwhile, we don't have much of a plan as opposed to, well, let's just, you know, have ad hoc campgrounds. Uh, we had Coronado Park, which just uh, blossomed exponentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like with this safe open space initiative, we're just trying to put toothpaste back into the tube. Right. Uh, you know, uh, w with the rules, with the regulation, um, I think some of the most problematic unhoused individuals are not going to go there. And so the core issue that everyone is so concerned about uh, with regard to sanitation, crime, drugs, it's not going to happen. We still have, you know, the free uh, public transit, which um, is causing problems with uh, crime and sanitation on our public uh, our, our public buses. Mm -hmm. That's not what every homeless person is, but it's creating a label right. and a stigma on everyone who is facing homelessness that I think was not the intent, but the, the utter lack of planning and reaction and the al allowing of this, of this crisis to truly snowball um, has created this problem. And so the impasse between the mayor and the city council, I think is just a, a much smaller uh, part mm -hmm. of the massive issue that Albuquerque faces that there seems to be no real solution for despite millions of dollars spent. Good point there. Good points there. Uh, Julianne, out of the three outdoor safe spaces, two are reserved, if that's the word for those who are with cars. And that's a good idea because there's a little distinction there. But the third safe outdoor space has received a lot of pushback from nearby businesses with seven different appeals filed against the city. And among those complaints is the concern that the nearby Sunset Memorial Park has previously had to deal with a lot of homeless intents. And would the safe space actively address this concern 
or in fact, we would encourage more tents to be up in that area. And that's a difficulty. I've driven by that Memorial Park when there have been tents up there. I'm curious your point of view on that. I think it's difficult to know what the effect will be until we try it. Mm -hmm. And I think with a lot of these, you know, kind of fear based opposition to new ideas um, that that trying to prognosticate what will happen it, it is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that having sanctioned spaces where people are welcomed to set up camp and they have access to some basic sanitation services, mm -hmm. um, unlike, you know, gathering places that just sort of happen in spaces where folks can camp because like, quote unquote, no one cares. Right. You know, we certainly have that happening in, um, you know, as you mentioned, some sometimes it's happening in public parks. In Santa Fe, there was a rule for uh, during the pandemic that allowed people to camp in parks. Um, right. We didn't have a Coronado Park situation happen here, mm -hmm. um, but we, we are seeing encampments pop up in places that are sort of, you know, forgotten plots of land. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone can agree that encouraging people who are living on the streets to get to places where they're welcomed versus being in places where they're unwelcomed um, is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Michael, I'm curious here, is there another way counselors can address their constituent concerns about these spaces here without trying to remove them entirely? What I mean by that is we seem to do this backwards. Council makes a vote, then they go out and take the temperature of their constituency second and then come back and make another kind of a vote when they've realized they're getting not, you know, it's not working out too well. Is there a middle ground here you can see where council can actually engage their constituencies a little bit more and talk about these things? Well, I think um, I, this may not be an answer to your, mm -hmm. That's directly right. to your question, but mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I, I'd be curious to know how knowledgeable of, uh, are the city councilors as it relates to the problem of homelessness, yeah. number one. Number two, how knowledgeable are they about the programs that are out there so that they can engage their constituents mm -hmm. in, 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 in coming from a base of knowledge? I mean, I'm not saying they don't. Maybe some of them already do have a clear understanding of what the city's offering and the programs and and who you know their, the city is targeting to, to assist I mean, clearly, there's there, 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 the, the 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 homeless population is a range of people. Mm -hmm. There are people who have substance abuse, drug issues, uh, who've been homeless for probably quite some time, and then it and and then there are women and children and and elders, seniors who are out there for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do we re do do city councilors and do even the system, the mayor's programs? Do they really have a who do we really have a thorough understanding of who the homeless are and what they need? Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, I, I, that's a question that comes to, to mind for me. Mm -hmm. Just a quick note it's here, guys, then, the Martinez. Can, oh, go ahead, Michael. Only then can we really, I think, create the kind of measures that need to be in place. Mm -hmm. Just a quick note, I wanted to get there. Sorry about that, Michael. The Martinez Town Association, along with the Manal Business Community, is going to hold a meeting at 6 o'clock at the Manal Gym on Monday. That's the 9th to express their concerns against the city sanctioned encampments in that Manal area, in the Martinez Town area. Um, Merritt, um, interesting, I'm going to get to this in the second part of my interview with uh, the mayor, but the faith community is really stepping up here. They're actually just saying, look, we can handle some of this. Should we be bringing the faith community a little closer to the decision-making process here? I mean, where there's a will, there's gotta be a way here. And let's talk to the people that have a will. I, I do think so, um, because there, uh, there is a desire and there is um, a, a capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's al there are already programs in place uh, uh, with with regard to this, uh, perhaps overnight, particularly some of the big box churches uh, that have the large parking lots, mm -hmm. who would be willing to have uh, people park there overnight. Um, this is uh, there. There are some great resources that would be uh, available. Uh, there are already, you know, the uh, Catholics have the St. Vincent de Paul Society that are already providing uh, mm -hmm. providing food and, and meals. So there are entrenched decades long programs to um, 
help the needy that exist in the faith community that the city could tap into. And I know the faith community would be very happy to help. Good points there. Thank you to our line opinion panelists. We'll be back for one final discussion on the recent settlement by the Archdiocese of Santa Fe in less than 10 minutes. But first, it's part two of my conversation with Albuquerque Mayor Tim Kelly. Let's talk about homelessness for a quick second. I want to back up just a couple of steps. You've been You've taken your share of grief over the homeless situation, the homeless encampments, other things over the past couple of years. I want to back up just a quick sec, Mayor, and just where do you see the homeless issue actually starting from? What, what's the problem here? Is it drug abuse? Is it lack of income, family problems? Where do you personally see the mm. homeless problem germinating from here in Albuquerque? Well, it's, I think it's a confluence of several things. I know that that makes it hard. You know, it's not like a politician answer. It's just true. Right. The lived experience of homeless folks is across a wide spectrum, and it has been for a long time. And that's also why it makes it you know difficult to solve. Right. So um, typically, what we know is the the path into being on the street in mm -hmm. terms of homelessness does involve fentanyl. I mean, fentanyl right. is destroying America and it's destroying Albuquerque. Uh, that is abundantly clear, and you can actually smell it if you drive around town. I mean, this is how big a deal it is. Now, that's a piece of it, but, but that's usually further down the journey to homelessness. Like, it usually doesn't start with fentanyl. It does start with uh, pressures around things like rent. Mm -hmm. It starts with people trying to get out of domestic violence situations. Mm -hmm. um, it starts with healthcare issues that, again, sort of uh, drain up all the, the, the funds and you know, chronic illness and so forth. There's definitely a mental health piece. There's definitely right. a behavioral health piece for other substance abuse. So all of those are areas. And there is, look, there is also a sliver of, uh, of, of folks who, you know, they've had multiple jobs and they may have, uh, you know, gotten themselves in a place where they just can't get that sustainable job. And it's actually just makes more sense for them to sort of restart. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things like come into play, but I know the, when you see, you know, the encampments and things like this, that's where the fentanyl takes hold. Right. And that makes it very hard to get people out of that situation because it's more than just saying, let's find you a job right. or let's find you a place to stay. Yep. You know, they need behavioral health treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about safe outdoor <clears throat> spaces. Uh, obviously, you are the lead face to have this happen here in Albuquerque. Anything you've learned over the last couple of years has been so much pushback, so much public input. Have you changed your, your sort of mindset about safe outdoor spaces at this point? You know, the irony about this is I'm not the lead face. Uh, the counselor Bassan, this was her idea. And she came to me and she said, I'd like to try this. And I said, let's go to Denver and take a look. And we looked at it and I said, you know, it's worth trying. I've never said that it's the be all end all to anything. I think it's a small tool mm -hmm. that we should try. Mm -hmm. And again, we're, look, in, in, in Albuquerque, like, we have a lot of challenges. So I'm open to any idea that might work. And Safe Outdoor Spaces is one of them, but I actually think it's a, it really is only applicable to a small amount of folks, but we still should try it. And so the irony about them flip-flopping and then sending me all these bills to kill Safe Outdoor Spaces, mm -hmm. you know, I know what we need most importantly. The biggest thing is the gateway. And that's what I am the face of and I have owned from day one. You know, we've got to get like a quarter of our unhoused in to, to find help. Gotcha. That's not going to happen to Safe Outdoor Space. Right. It will happen. You know, that hospital used to help a thousand people a day with health and healing. And I think by this time next year, it's going to be about doing the same thing. Yes. That will make a noticeable difference. It will help thousands of people every day. Yeah. That's what I'm focused We've on. We've gotten a lot of feedback from the faith community that they're willing with their own property and putting their own money into the situation. They're willing to do safe outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. Have you had conversations with the faith, faith leadership around town about this? Oh yeah, well now, I mean, fast forward because I've had to veto every measure that tries to kill it. Uh, we have, and actually we, we work with them on their plan and you know, we also subsidize them. So, right. so we, there's a fund that they also council uh, voted to kill and I vetoed and kept. So we are working with them and um, you know, I'm excited to give it a try. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is a tool that we want to try. But the volume, you have to look at the volume. If there's 5,000 unhoused, you know, maybe we can help a couple of hundred in safe outdoor spaces. I'll take, I'll take it. We mm -hmm. will change 100 people's lives. It's worth it to do it. Mm -hmm. But I also know we need to help thousands of people a day. And that's what the Gateway Center is all about. So it's about both. Mm -hmm. And uh, the faith community, by the way, I mean, they've been with 
uh, with me and our administration from you know COVID to now homelessness, and I'm grateful for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and even you know Muslim shootings in between, and we have an amazing interfaith community in Albuquerque, and it's something that uh, we pray together uh, and we work together, and it's been a special experience even for me as mayor. Mm -hmm. I'm interested, interested in knowing or hearing from you your frustration <coughs> level with council right now. Mm. Where, where are you at with city council? You know, believe it or not, on big things, we actually work quite well. Okay. Uh, the budget, I think on these zoning changes for housing, and we'll see how it plays out, but All I right. think they've been very receptive. And a lot of our votes on major issues have been very bipartisan. Mm -hmm. So uh, ironically, like also, I think, you know, when it matters, I think we've, we've been doing a good job and having a nice... Uh, you know, back and forth with respect to policy making. Mm -hmm. Now, on the small stuff, you know, I do think there are counselors who become much more political. Like their their whole goal is just to make me look bad, and that's frankly what it sounds like when I watch them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's unfortunate. You know, it's okay. You can you can take your shots at at outcomes and activities, but I see it much much more personal for a couple of counselors, and also against city staff. You know, I always mm. say you can take all the shots you want at me, but like. Leave the police alone. Leave our homeless division people, leave them alone personally. Right. You, know, you know, don't criticize that they're not doing enough. Like these people live and breathe trying to help Albuquerque. And so take it out on me instead. Sure. And uh, so that I think has been the rub. And you see that play out in public. And I think that's why people think that uh, you know, relations aren't as good. But I will say this, they have been great on the big issues. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what's most important in the long run. Mm -hmm. Last question, and we want to thank you again for coming in. Uh, are you thinking about a third term? Is that a possibility uh, to finish some of the things you have started? I've known a lot of politicians, and that frustrates them terribly to start something and not be able to get something down the road. Is that something <laughs> that beats in your heart? You are definitely the first person to ask me this one. So, uh, you know, I have said, first off, I do love this job, and I am very sensitive to getting things done. And I know we lost a lot during the pandemic. So I'm absolutely open to it. But, you know, look, it's, I mean, it's three years away. We've got lots of runway. Uh, but, you know, I, I hope as long as people will have me in any position, I, I came, you know, and decided to dedicate my life to public service. And so um, I'm totally open to it, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also know it's a long ways out and it's at the end of the day, you know, not even my choice. So Fair we'll enough. see how much people are interested in the third term. But let me say this. Please. I have those, um, you know, mayors mm -hmm. in other cities, there is a trend for term limits, yes. but it's all three, it's three terms. Right. Uh, in Denver and in other cities, it's not two. And I think it's a reflection of just the length of things like even the rail trail. I mean, that project's gonna take like 10 years. Right. Uh, the gateway, I mean, I think we're gonna be in a good place in this term, but uh, you do see an acknowledgement around the country. Uh, Louisville is the same way. So th for mayors, three terms seems to be what people are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller, thank you for coming in, seeing us here at New Mexico PBS. Thank you. Welcome back to our line panelists for one final discussion. A federal bankruptcy judge has approved a $121 million reorganization plan for the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. That includes payments to abuse victims and requires church officials to establish a public archive detailing how decades of abuse occurred throughout the state. Now, Julianne, does this mark an end of a conversation for Catholic officials here in New Mexico or is this one of a number of steps the Catholic Church here needs to make to recognize its past history of abuse? Yeah, I don't think it's the end of the conversation mm -hmm. at all. Um, you know, this trove of documents, it's going to be donated to the, or it's going to be housed at the University of New Mexico uh, Special Collections, uh, Zimmerman Library, and it's going to be accessible to um, historians and journalists and advocates and people interested in the future theology of the Catholic Church. And I think that the, the documents will be used for, as they're intended, mm -hmm. um, far into the future to try to help understand what happened in, in order to, um, you know, do something mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, the, the conversations about the settlement agreement, the conversations about all the um, disposal of property and how this affected the local parishes, um, you know, 75 million of that 121 million settlement is coming from, you know, basically the church's bank account and the bank accounts of the individual parishes. Mm -hmm. and the remainder is coming from the insurance companies. 
Um, and then you've also got this $8 million that's coming from, uh, you know, separate religious orders like the the infamous uh, servants of the paraclete in the Hamas. Mm -hmm. So I think just understanding what's happening and as the payments start to be made and some more of these measures of accountability start to happen, it's really just um, another chapter, mm -hmm. you could say. Michael, tough question. Is this a satisfactory outcome for all parties here, for the victims, for the church, for the greater Catholic community of New Mexico? Does this settle anything for any of those groups? Well, I would hope so, but mm -hmm. I think it, re it remains to be seen. You know, I mean, this was, I, I think this, this, was, this, was, this was a horrible thing. Um, and I think one of the one of the factors is just how long this went on mm. um this was not this was this this was over how many i mean you know this i mean this is a long-standing issue here in new mexico mm -hmm. and it never was addressed appropriately and in a timely manner um and um you know i i i my prayers go out to the archbishop who walked into this <laughs> coming from Utah, as I understand, right. and to inherit this and then have to try and address it and resolve it and and and, and move things forward. I, I hope people can come together and I hope I hope there are lessons to be learned um, in terms of, you know, these these institutions that we have. Um, particularly churches who are who put people put their faith and their trust in and and then to have it betrayed in in this manner is 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 heartbreaking mm -hmm. and i i i hope i hope that uh, i hope that uh, i hope that this never happens again that's right and court record shows it goes back to the 40s this kind of thing it's just oh it's so heartbreaking merit uh, let me follow up on something Julianne mentioned. I'm glad she did the public archive. That's going to be made in cooperation with the University of New Mexico, actually. Now, should the university's historians and religious scholars have a hand in the oversight of this public archive? I mean, again, telling the story here, so to speak, this is going to be a, have to be a very carefully done thing. What's your sense of how these uh, folks should approach this? I feel the archive needs to be public immediately, and I say that mm -hmm. as a Catholic whose family moved to New Mexico before I turned two. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Silver City, and for those who don't know the full story, um, Servants of the Paraclete operated a kind of rehab center in the Hamas, mm -hmm. and priests who um, were found to be uh, molesters would be sent there for a year or so for rehab and then they would be sent to uh parishes parishes in rural communities what, what, what would be called mission parishes that would get a new priest every two or three years mm -hmm. my parish in silver city was one of those parishes and we now know that at least two of our priests when i was growing up came from that center oh wow and um uh we were very active parishioners. My mother served as president of the parish council. My father served as president of the parish council. And not knowing that and having your family very active um, in the parish and the liturgy and in contact is very upsetting. And there is a need to know this. And I will say the clergy now is very candid and very open. My pastor uh, talks about this a lot as his own experience. He's from Albuquerque. He went to St. Pius. He talks about this, and I will tell you, when there is a second collection for the archdiocese, I think parishioners take it uh, from a, with a grain of salt and look at it very differently than a collection for the parish. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you don't see parishioners wanting to bail out the diocese and the archdiocese. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly don't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's that's not where I want my charitable dollars to go, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the archive um, needs to be made uh, digitized and made open to the public immediately. Mm -hmm. Hey, Julianne, just get, what, go ahead, go ahead, Julianne, um, please. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna pop in that, you know, the settlement, um, it, it meant that a lot of people who took the courageous step to sue the archdiocese, mm -hmm. to try to make sure that these stories were told, those cases are going away now. You know, they're not going to get to trial. So part of what's really important about this archive is this, how did this happen? Right. How were the people in power 
actively making taking steps to cover up and hide and keep children being hurt. And I think that, you know, everyone sort of knows what happened at this point or a lot of the details, but sort of how that power flex happened. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the big things that, that people will be able to learn from the archive. I'm, gl I'm glad you got that in. That's actually a very key point there. Julianne, let me stay with you on this uh, interesting uh, from up your way efforts to settle the lawsuits. The Archdiocese, uh, Archdiocese has sold the Temple Montefiore in Las Vegas to the Las Vegas Jewish community, a nonprofit group that organizes Jewish celebrations and services in the area. The Temple Montefiore was the first synagogue in New Mexico established in 1922. So are historical rec reclamations like this, former synagogue, a silver lining, so to speak, in this case? It's interesting. I mean, I, I think you can say that, um, but, I, but I also would say that the, the Jewish community that came together to fundraise to buy this building from the archdiocese really feel, felt like they were sort of over the barrel. Like, we yeah. want our historic building back. The archdiocese is in trouble, um, but there was a sense that, that they sort of squeezed, you know, every dime they could get um, out of that property. And, and mm -hmm. um, so certainly it's good for the Jewish community in Las Vegas. And there was a, a, a temple um, a dedication that happened right around the beginning of Hanukkah, which was really well attended. And I think it's really important for that community. Um, and you're going to see these archdiocese properties all over the state mm -hmm. um, continue to have sort of an an uncertain fate. Um, I'm thinking about a property that's on the east side of Santa Fe that's like a retreat center that um, someone was talking about just in the last couple of years. Well, I'm going to buy that from the church and turn it into a hotel. Right. Um, that it's, fizzled as far as I know, but I'm really curious, there. you know, kind of what will we see um, happen to these historic uh, you know, archdiocese properties, yep. how will they change in their use over time? Good points there. Thanks again to our line panel as always for this week. Be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. And catch any episodes you may have missed on our PBS video app or your Roku or smart TV. Thanks for joining us for the first show of 2023, as well as to Michael, Mara, and Julianne for their contributions. I also want to thank Mayor Keller for sitting with me just before the holidays. Now, we covered a lot of ground, including what you heard earlier regarding safe outdoor spaces. Now that even mentioning them has survived a city council veto, perhaps we can start fresh on this issue. The opening of the old Loveless facility next week for 50 men and women is a good start. Now, momentum is hard to gin up when a seemingly intractable problem like homelessness dominates our eyeline, but it has to start somewhere. Perhaps the new year will afford all involved a new perspective. We can only hope. Thanks again for joining us, for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.